Hey guys, today we are in Romans chapter 8. We've just finished in chapter 6 and chapter 7 of talking about how believers have died to their sinful ways and to the law, right? And so here, chapter 8 is kind of the uh, the benefits, right? Because you're a believer, because you have died to sin, and because you have died to the law, now Paul is writing to these Roman Christians as saying, here's, here's the perks of it, right? Not just that you have to do all of this, but God is a God of blessing. And here's some blessings that you get for living a godly life and believing in Jesus Christ. So we're going to see a couple of these. Uh, in the first one, we see in the first four verses, the first uh, the first blessing or the first um, freedom that we get is that we get the freedom from condemnation. And we see that very uh, in the very first verse, right? There is therefore, right? Here's the result of not being, um, of dying to sin and dying to law, right? There is, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That word condemnation is the word katakrima. And the word katakrima means um, sentencing, right? So if you're guilty, right? Some people will say that you're guilty. A jury says that you're guilty. And then you get the sentence um, for what you're guilty for, right? So here, Paul says that believers are not uh, do not receive that guilty sentence. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For one, is a huge blessing, right? As Christians, we're not to be condemned by God. God will not condemn us. That's in his word. It's a promise. But he goes on to explain even more what this means. For the law of the Spirit, for the reason or the principle of the Holy Spirit of life has set you free. We have freedom in Christ Jesus from what? From the law, the principle of sin and death. So we are not condemned, we do we are not held to sin, and we will not die, right? These are some benefits, some blessings that we get. Verse three, for God has done what the law could not do, right? What did the law, what did the Old Testament want us to do? to be perfect, right? That's what the law said. You have to be perfect. And he gave the Old Testament law. We could not do that because we were weakened by flesh. Remember uh, yesterday, our um, chapter seven, our flesh is corrupted in sin. It's all it wants to do. So we could not keep the law. So we could not be saved, right? So what happened? God has done what the law could not do. The law cannot save us, but God through Jesus Christ is the what gave us salvation. How did he do it? By sending his own son in in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. This does not mean that Jesus sinned. He sent in the likeness of sinful flesh. What does that mean? Outward appearance, human, right? Remember yesterday, flesh equals sin, right? It's not saying that he sent Jesus to be a sinner. He's saying he sent him in the manner of sin, which is flesh, right? John 1, 1 in the beginning was the word and the word became flesh, became sarks is that word, right? That we looked at yesterday, sinful flesh, uh, humanness. Um, he condemned sin in the flesh. God condemned sin in the flesh. How did he do that? Jesus on the cross. Jesus being a flesh, he condemned it on the cross. And why did he put Jesus on the cross and condemn him? In order that the righteousness requirement of the law might be fulfilled. How are, how are people taken to be with God? They must be holy. They must be like God. Well, we can't do that ourselves, right? So what happened? that the righteous requirement of the law would be filled. How was that done? By the death of a perfect lamb, by the death of Jesus, fully man, fully God. God redeems people not to sin more, but to do as he pleases.
And so it just shows our heart in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled. Um, might be filled in us who walk. And that, that word we've talked about it a lot. This means habitually, your habitual, continually practice of life. Who walk not according to the flesh, the sinful flesh, but according to the spirit, the Holy Spirit, to God's word to God's standard, right? So the first freedom, the first thing that we get because we believe in Christ is we get freedom from condemnation. The second thing we get is that we get freedom from control, freedom from control. And this is verses five through 14. And, and this is a long chapter and I'm not going to have time to break this all apart. So, but I just want you to get these main things. We get freedom from condemnation and now we get freedom from control. Um, Let's see, verse five. For those who live according to the flesh, sinful, right? They set their minds to the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, godly, set their minds on the things of the spirit, godly. For to set your mind on the flesh, to set your mind on sin is death. Everybody dies, so it's eternal death. But to set your mind on the spirit is life and peace, life, eternal life, and peace, mortal peace, right? So if you live a sinful life, the only thing you get is eternal death. If you live a life that is to godly, uh, you set your standard to the spirit, right? You're a believer. Not only do you get eternal life, something eternal like the, the those who do not believe get something eternal, but you also get something uh, mortal, physical in this life. And that's peace. That's what the world is truly looking for. That's why people drink. That's why people do drugs. That's why people are addicted to sex. That's why people do everything to get a peace, a calm inside of them, but only the saved get that. Um, verse seven, for the mind that is set on the flesh, sin is what? Is hostile to God for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot unsafe people cannot live a godly life. They, they might do some good things. They might do some godly deeds, but overall their life cannot be godly because they simply cannot. They're living their life towards their flesh, towards sin, toward against God. For the mind that is set, I'm sorry, verse eight, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Non-saved people cannot please God, no matter what they do, whether they do something good, whether they do something bad, it doesn't matter. It doesn't please God because there, there's a, there's a wall there. There's a spiritual a wall. It's called holiness that the unspiritual, the unholy cannot, cannot be with the holy, right? With God. Verse nine, you, however, are not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit. You're saved. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, I love that word, it's the okio, um, and this is the word where we where we get the idea of asking Jesus into our heart. That word okio means to, um, to dwell in someone's home. It means to come in and to sit in the recliner, right? To, to be comfortable in somebody else's house, right? So it says, but in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, remember our flesh, even though we're saved, our flesh is sinful. The spirit, the Holy Spirit is life because of righteousness. That's why we want to be saved because even though we are flesh, even though we have sin in our bodies and our members of our bodies still want to do sinful things. But when we are given new life, when God gives us a new mind, he makes us a new creation, that Holy Spirit is what gives us a new life, a new purpose, a new goal, a new sense of life, right? That's what salvation is. Verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus, that's the Holy Spirit is the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. 
The Holy Spirit, who had enough power to resurrect Jesus, also lives in every single believer. And that same power is inside of a mortal body and a mortal person living this life, even though their body is of sin, their physical body is of sin, it's the Holy Spirit that will give them the power um, that they need to be that godly person, to, to do godly works, to be able to do and pray and want godly things. So then, brothers, brothers and sisters, so then Christians, we are debtors. We're in debt, right? We're in debt, not to the flesh, not to our sinful bodies to live according to the flesh. But if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. We are debtors to God, so when God gives us the Spirit who gives us new life, a new goal, a new sense of purpose, a new creation, then we are debtors to him. And how, how are we in debt? That we are to put to death the deeds of the body, of the flesh, right? Killing sin inside of our body is the characteristic of a Christian. When someone gets saved and you track their life, they should not get into more and more and more sin. doesn't mean they become sinless, but it means that they have a new focus, a new vision, that, that, that everything is different. They're no longer following their physical body who wants sin. They're following the spiritual body, the Holy Spirit, that will give them the things of God. Verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit are... Uh, uh, the Spirit of God are sons of God, right? So, so we who are believers, we are sons. We are like Christ, and we'll get into that more, right? So here we've had two things that we get, right? Freedom from condemnation. We got freedom from control. We're no longer controlled by our sinful body. But then thirdly, we have the freedom from the fear of separation of God. So many Christians fear that that. God's going to leave them. They can do something so bad, step away from God. We've already talked about this in chapter five and chapter six. Um, but here Paul tells us once again, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Jesus Christ defeated death on the cross. So death would be our only fear. And we no longer have that fear. If God saves us from eternal death, then why would we fear that God would let us go? He saved us. He will continue to save us and always keep us until uh, until the time and we get to heaven and we have our resurrected bodies, right? Um, but you have received the spirit of adoptions by son. We have been adopted by God. Right, we're not his. We're not his children. That's 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 Jesus, right? The second part of the Trinity. But we have been adopted into the family. We are we are brothers and sisters in God's family, by whom we cry, Abba, Father, Abba, Daddy. Right? Aramaic means Daddy, Papa. Uh, the Spirit Himself, the Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of the God. The Holy Spirit will always give you evidence that you are saved and you are continued to be saved. Now it's up to you to listen to that spirit, but he will always give you. How does he give you, um, how does he give you evidence? By the things we talked about. Are you doing the things of the body? Are you doing the things of the spirit of God? Are, are you living for the things of your flesh? Are you living for God, right? Such, such easy evidence, are you saved or not? Because um, remember, we read earlier in the chapter that unsaved people cannot be godly people, right? Uh, so very clear, easy evidence. Um, the Spirit himself bears witness that our spirit, that we are children of God, and if children, then we are heirs of God. We have been adopted into God, and we're fellow heirs with Christ, that we get to share in God's resources with Jesus, right? This is amazing, that we're just not brought into the family, but we get to share in the inheritance of God, um, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. 
You see that word provided? Uh, in, in the Greek, it's not like a question mark. It's not saying, well, provided you do something. In the Greek, it means you absolutely are, right? That you're gonna be fellow heirs with Christ because you will suffer with him. You will be mocked and scorned and ridiculed just like Jesus was. You will suffer with Christ in order that we may be also glorified with him. Our persecution on this earth is another evidence that we are saved and we're continued to be saved. No one stands up for God if they don't love and trust and uh, hold God dear in their heart. They would just bow away, right? And so here we have, because believers have died to sin, died to law, we have the freedom of condemnation, we have the freedom from the control of sin, we have the freedom from fear of the separation of God, but now, Things kind of change in verse starting in verse 18. And because believers have this new life, not only do we get to know have these freedoms, but we get to know more about God. We get to know more about who God is and what God's plan is, right? So in um, the first thing that we get to know about God, starting in verse 18 through 25, is the we get to know the promises of God. We get to know what God has in store for us. For I consider, that word consider means calculate, for I'm calculating, right? I'm thinking about all this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time on earth are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed for us. For the creation, the new heaven, the new earth, waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. That word revealing is the word apocalypse, right? Apocalyptus, um, but it's apocalypse, right? For the revealing of the sons of God. The new heaven and the new earth that is promised in revelation by God is waiting for all the new sons, the new sons and daughters of heaven to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willing, but because of God who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of glory of the children of God. Now, what does that mean? It means that that in this idea that creation is waiting, right? Um, this new heaven and earth is waiting to be revealed for all of God's children, his, his sons and his daughters, right? And all this is happening um, because why? Because the earth that we live on, right, it has its bondage to corruption. We would simply call this today in scientific terms, the law of entropy, right? The world is not getting better. It's getting worse, right? It, it, it's spinning more and more and more, not towards perfection, but actually away from perfection, right? And so because the earth was cursed, um, because of sin coming in, all this is happening, but the new heaven and the earth, the promise of God of heaven is waiting and it's waiting for what? For the freedom of the glory of the children of God. It's waiting for the believers to be free from sin, to have new bodies, resurrected bodies, that we would go to heaven as God has promised. Verse 22, for we know that a whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons and the redemption of our bodies. We, um, not only creation is waiting for heaven to come, right? But our bodies are waiting. We are waiting as Christians. We're waiting to come and to say, man, it's it, heaven's a lot better than earth, right? We're ready to get those new resurrected bodies. You see where it says um, in verse 23, and not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. As Christians, okay, this is a little, I don't know if you know this, this is a little top secret thing, right? As Christians, we are spiritually sensitized, I would say, spiritually sensitized to corruption and sin. Have you ever watched the news? <laughs> Uh, or watch social media and you think, 
how do those people get that bad, right? How do they think that's good, right? It's because you have the spirit inside of you. You are spiritually sensitized to say that is wrong, that is sin. How do they not see that is wrong, right? Do you ever watch the news right now and think about how can people who were born a biological male or female now think that there's something else or an animal? Are you kidding me? That's crazy. That's biologically crazy, right? It's because we're Christians, because we're the first fruits of the spirit. We have God inside of us to realize what is sin and what is not, right? So even in our bodies, we're groaning inwardly and waiting for the adoptions of son. We're waiting for heaven. We're waiting for a resurrected body. We're waiting for what God has promised us in Revelations chapter 20, 21, right? Uh, for in this hope, we are saved. Now, hope uh, that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what sees, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait with, it, with patience. Paul's saying we're hoping, but we're not hoping for something that we're, we're hoping that it happens. He says, we know, we absolutely know this is gonna happen. We know that there's gonna be a new heaven and new earth. We know that we're gonna get new bodies. That's why he says we wait for patience, right? So we, we get to know the promises of God. Secondly, we get to know the purposes of God. Likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness, in our human condition here on this earth. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, I'm going to speak a lot more about this in a few weeks because we're talking about prayer at Green Acres on Sunday mornings. Um, but basically, even though we're saved, right, our body, our mind is still of flesh. It's still of sin, and so here Paul's saying that when we pray, we really don't even know how to pray because we want to pray for what our sinful body and our sinful mind has, right? But the Holy Spirit comes in and he intercedes for us, right? And he comes and we, when we don't even know what to pray for, right? When we don't even know what God wants for our life, the Holy Spirit is always taking our needs to the Father. He's always taking them uh, and interceding in there for us, right? And we'll talk more about that in a few weeks. Um, and he who searches hearts, that's God, right? God searches our hearts and our minds. He knows everything. Knows what in the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For Christians, all things work together for good. Not for our good but for his good. Our Father who art in heaven, how will be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's not for our, it's for him, right? Everything that happens it is working together for him. For those who are called according to the purpose, uh, for those who he foreknew, he predestined, basically this whole line, and I know you can go really deep in this and get into Calvinism and all these thoughts, but it, here's the reality. God knows you, God created you, God called you, he saved you, he knows you, and you will he will and you will know that coming true because you know the purposes of God, right? Uh, so we know that the promises of God, we know the purposes of God, and then last one lastly, we know the protection of God, protection of God, starting in verse thirty one What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? You see that word if. In the Greek language, that word if is called what is called a conditional participle. It, it, it This means it's a word that's conditioned on something before it. But what we don't see in the English is that God has already fulfilled that, right? And so instead of saying if God is for us, it really would, should say in our English language, because God is for us, right? As Christians, as believers, God is never against us. He is always for us. So the question is not if God is for us, it's because God is for us, right? Then who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Paul saying, because God saved you, because God sent his son Jesus for you, then God, then that's the reason that God will continue to save you and keep you and protect you. 
Who shall bring any charges against God's elect? It's a rhetorical question. No one. It is God who justifies. God is the judge. If anybody brings anything up to you, it doesn't matter because God is the ultimate judge. And God has already declared you righteous, holy, pure, purified, right? You have been imputed God's righteousness because you imputed your sin on Jesus, right? Um, who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Jesus, right? Who saved you? Who indeed is interceding for us? Jesus is always continuously interceding for you before the Father. He loved you. He came to this world. He died for you. He, he took the sins from you. He saved you. He gave you his righteousness. And so you are adopted. You are now co-heirs in heaven with Jesus, and, with Jesus and with God. And what happens, Jesus, until you get there and to that new heaven and earth, he's always interceding before his father for you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from salvation? The answer is no one. Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? No, nothing can separate you from your salvation. Verse 37, no, no, nothing, nothing can separate you. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. We are hyper conquerors. We are more than conquerors through Jesus who loved us. It's not because you're good. It's because Jesus is good. He saved you and that was enough. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor present things nor things to come nor powers nor heights nor death nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, from salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord. So because we are believers, okay, just to wrap this up, because we are believers, we know that we are free from condemnation. We know we are free from the control of sin. We know that we are free from the separation of God. But we also get to know that the promises of God, that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. We're going to have resurrected body and God's going to keep those promises. We also get to know that the purposes of God, the purposes of God is to what? To, to live out that all things will work together for his will, right? That, that we are justified and glorified before God because he knew us and he called us into salvation, right? And then lastly, we still have, we know that we are protected with God. If because God is for us, no one can be against us because God is the ultimate judge. He's the ultimate say-so. I know chapter eight's long. I know this is a long video. I'm so sorry, but I'm just trying to make sure you understand how all of these chapters just flow so well together about salvation. So I hope that makes sense. Um, and that gives you a lot to chew on. If you have questions, make sure you just uh, text me, email me, social media, whatever. We'll have to answer those for you. Um, but we will see you on Monday in chapter nine. God bless.